Okay. Good to go. Yeah, shall I start? Okay, fine. Um, well, thank you. Uh, it's really good to be here. And um, well, my career uh, is like one year old, so I have no excuse not to finish within 10 minutes. Um, but I'm going to tell it in the order it didn't happen. Uh, history is nonlinear anyway. And the brief is to discuss uh, two projects, a thesis project and a recent project. I already presented my EMARC thesis project at the beginning of thesis prep, uh, at least to the students. So for thesis, I'm going to substitute my PhD dissertation. And for recent, I'm going to present two projects that emerged at the same time, a Spring Show and a co-authored article published in the last issue of Locke. In so doing, I want to outline an idea about what it means to work on the practice of theory and to answer the question as well. I've often been asked about my uh, career, if it can be called that uh, yet, is uh, which is why did you switch to architecture after a PhD in art history? Can you hear me okay? I know maybe my own trajectory is not one you might all want to or be able to follow, but everybody has their own particular way. And the piece of career advice uh, I would venture after reflecting on that question is basically set off in a direction with the expectation that it will lead you to places you could never imagine and embrace that. Oops, no, no, not that one, hang on. Oh, sorry. Just trying to find the right thing to share with you. Sorry, one second. Okay, this is the right one. So I got to Yale uh, where I did my PhD on the basis of a proposal to study one thing, but it struck me on arriving in the Americas for the first time with overpowering force that a lot of the most vital current art production was by black artists. And at Yale, the most exciting art history was being taught by Robert Paris Thompson whose books, Flash of the Spirit and African Art Emotion, you see here, and some of you who took my lectures will already be familiar with these works. Uh, trust your instincts. I immediately reoriented myself in that direction and embarked on a dissertation research project covering both the Black Atlantic world and India on the basis of interlinking transnational networks of trade, labor, militarism, culture, and of course, architecture. This led to a series of extended field trips in India and Jamaica. In both places, you see the ruination of architecture of the modern Western classical tradition, which is so shocking when it's precisely this language which defines civic and federal architecture in the West and which is preserved and maintained so immaculately as the very emblem and ideological basis of state power and health. The image you see here is the ruin of the British colonial residence palace in the Indian city of Lucknow after the first war of independence in 1857, showing artillery destruction by Indian soldiers who rebelled against their British commanders after a long history of abuse and oppression. The image you see here is the ruined shell of the chief residence of the British state in Spanish town, Jamaica. Spanish Town being the capital before Kingston, where the emancipation of slavery in the British Empire was proclaimed in 1838, and which was later burned and subject to deterioration and purposeful neglect during the long duration of Jamaican decolonization. So my first interest in architecture was in the destruction of architecture, 
which is to say the dismantling of power? What is the architecture that opposes architecture? That was my first thesis question at that time. And the answer I hypothesized was that a new architecture must be germinated in pre-architectural acts. That is to say, before a new architecture can be built, the old one must be reckoned with. But how do you do that from a position of material deprivation? The answer I proposed was that transformative eruptions in the social, political, and eventually architectural sphere were preceded by pre-architectural acts of embodied performativity. In other words, the energies which might at some point explode into the creation of a new world of life and architecture and material means would first of all be worked out, coiled up, and stored in the receptacles of the aesthetic. Most especially, I found that this energy landed on what I called figures in states of extraordinary metamorphosis. And the project for me became to collect archives of these images together. In Jamaica, these included images of marunage, that is, anti-colonial guerrilla warfare performed by maroons, who were unenslaved African women and men who established settlements in the mountains of Jamaica. It also included this archive images of cudgeling, uh, that is an Afro-Atlantic martial art, and most, all, and most especially in terms of my research at that moment, the archive included images of dancing, because dancing was the thing where the body was the medium and the architecture, and you needed nothing else. You could assemble together in a spontaneous architectural surround outside of or beyond the scope of colonial plantation architecture. And in that act of assembly was a prefiguration of the shape of a different world. Sorry, John, could you move your cursor? Because like the, the thing is cutting out some of the text. Is that possible? Or does oh. that just... Yeah. Oh, I see. So I didn't see that. That will disappear, right? Is that better? Yeah. Uh, there were few places where this metamorphic potentiality of the architecturalizing body came more sh sharply into focus than the image of the carnival performer who channeled on their body momentous change by re-aestheticizing the space of the street. Writing during the Algerian War of Independence, the uh, Martinician thinker from Martinique in the Caribbean, uh, Franz Fanon put it like this, quote, well before the political or armed struggle, a careful observer could sense and feel in these arts the pulse of a fresh stimulus and the coming combat. Unusual forms of expression, original themes no longer invested with the power of invocation, but the power to rally and mobilize with the approaching conflict in mind. Everything conspires to stimulate the colonized sensibility and to rule out and reject attitudes of inertia or defeat. By imparting new meaning and dynamism to artisanship, dance, music, literature, and the oral epic, the colonized subject restructures his own perception. The world no longer seems doomed. Conditions are ripe for the inevitable confrontation." End quote. Uh, Fanon doesn't say architecture, but I wanted to say architecture as well, and to add it to that list and to understand it as a kind of enterprise like Fanon describes, that is to understand architectural acts as rallying and mobilizing with dynamism and artisanship, restructuring perception, making the conditions ripe for the evolution of a world that does not seem doomed. In the article that I recently co-authored with Mira for Log, um, something like that is beginning to be worked out. First of all, because it brings uh, architecture to the street. It's the kind of story of a perambulation around uh, a part of LA. Uh, 
second because it embeds within it uh, the urban life of a particular community and because it identifies uh, what Mira called um, an exalted formalism which sits on top of and agitates the past like the extraordinary Plasticine wigs of contemporary artist Ellen Gallagher, which are referenced uh, in the piece in relation to the stucco work of this building. The conversation revolves around a reading of a not famous building on Jefferson and Arlington by the white American architect Robert Stacy Judd, who had a penchant for cultural transvestitism, both on his own person and in his neo-Mayan architecture, like this bank, uh, which is now a Hispanic church. Moving waywardly between different cultural motifs and layering up a polysemic crust of associations, the conversation both gave a new visibility to a kind of overlooked LA architecture, as well as foregrounding the privacy of such a community building and the limits of what can be known about the space. Needless to say, uh, this project is especially powerful to me because it's a collaborative piece of writing that evolved out of an ongoing series of conversations and thinking together. And I think any act that breaks the mold of career individualism right now is worthy. Which leads finally to Spring Show uh, and the procession which you all know and which was also the product of a collective act, especially with Mari Kurti, Saleh, Jamshir, Zayn Mechen, Kumran, Partiban, and Justine Poulain, among others. Maybe in the light of these preceding projects, the riotousness of the processional form now kind of makes more sense within the trajectory sketched out of architectural and pre-architectural acts of provocation, disturbance, and radicalizing. In some sense, I felt I just wanted to put a frame or container around what is going on at SciArc and just squeeze it a little and put the beat underneath it and let it run, which is what I think happened. And in doing so, I hope that it communicated to the audience outside of SciArc as much as inside the potentiality of architecture as currently practiced at SciArc right now. And what at least I perceived as an exuberant attitude to form and material in the hands of a collective body that either was or might be committed necessarily equally to a maximalist architectural expressionism and structural transformation of social context. That's it, thank you. Thank you, that was great. I think that for for many people, I mean, it's it's quite again fresh, so they can see the the relationship between your pieces and uh, Spring Show. Um, so we'll we'll set up questions later, but um, I'd like to you know uh, introduce Ramiro. Uh, thank you, Sean. Um, and again, I think if people want to add into the chat um, some questions for Sean, you can you know this is kind of an active. Uh, platform. So, hi Ramiro, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, thanks Sean. That, that was really interesting, John. Um, much, obviously much more contemporary than what I'm going to show. Um, this was a, an interesting exercise, Florencia, and as you mentioned about digging into kind of boxes and archives, um, my, my career path has been a kind of more bumpy one, maybe less, less uh, typical of moving through academia, uh, interning, working in an office, and then perhaps starting your career. Um, I think you know. I know the students don't know this, but I'm a I'm a Syrac alum. I, I graduated from Syrac in 1996 uh, from the B Art program, um, and it was quite a different school uh, back then. Uh, but so what I'm going to show is two two sets of projects, so uh, marked by these years. So in the first, uh, the first building project I worked on, the first commission I got uh, six months after graduating uh, CyArk, uh, young and naive. And I think that this phase uh, I would put into the category of um, the uh, fake it till you make it. So one of the rules that I think the the artist uh, that, that Florentia sent that great article on 
the Fit 50 rules, I, I think it was, something like that. Um, and then the second one, the second set is um, a project I did uh, with, uh, in a studio with Jason Payne at UCLA, where I got my master's, uh, to what I'm currently working on. And so part of what's interesting about this is obviously the, the differences that come up uh, in this, but also you start to see things that carry over, whether it's interests or sensibilities or things like that. Um, so this is the first thing, first building I worked on. Uh, it was a commission I got with a friend uh, to design this house for a wealthy couple, wealthy retired couple in Beverly Hills. They had an art collection, extensive art collection. And uh, basically, we kind of stumbled into this and we convinced them that we had the experience to, to do this. And we did not have the experience to do this. I had not yet worked on a full set of construction documents. We were very naive and green, but we were so eager to build that we convinced them and then basically taught ourselves how to uh, work through it. You know, dealing with the clients, working with the consultants, uh, working through budgets, you know, all, all those things that go, that go along with the project. Uh, so that, that's one part of it. And so after this project, uh, we basically launched a design build practice that lasted for almost six years. And after that, I got burnt out with um, basically dealing with this and uh, basically went back to grad school, sold my half of the partnership and went to grad school. And so that, that began a, a different career. But the other thing that was interesting about this uh, and looking at it is, um, you know, this was a project that was all drawn by hand. Um, I, I, at that moment in time, I was so anti-computer because I was at this moment in Syrac where halfway through the computer started to enter and I was more of a romantic kind of architect, believed in like the charcoal drawing and that whole type of, of production and, and imagery and just completely rejected it. And so it wasn't until after this first project that I embraced the, the computer. But so anyway, this one part of the project, we had this stair wall and it was designed in plan using um, the, the flexible snake of you know, one of the ways that architects made curves back then. You had French curves, uh, the flexible snake and other means. And so we were able to draw it, but when it came to time to build it, the contractors didn't know how to build it. And so I went back to the very first drawing that I made at Sire, my 1A studio with Carl Chu, who you probably don't, most of you probably don't know of. He's probably one of the most radical uh, architects and architectural educators uh, that's been out there for a while. But anyway, there was this, uh, we made these weird forms and we had to draw it and describe them. And so I wanted to understand each of the surfaces. And so I invented this completely naive, uh, incorrect or inaccurate way of unfolding each of the surfaces through technical transcription, almost like a translating or applying the techniques of descriptive geometry to understand this. And so I know that this is wrong, but it produced a kind of interesting drawing. So I went back to that and use that kind of technique to figure out how to build this curved wall um, with part of it was cantilevered and there's like a steel beam in there and it's kind of a bizarre construction. Um, but so I used that technique and I, and I was like, I hope this works. And so we went into the space with the contractors when it was under construction and we laid a series of plumb, of plumb lines from the ceiling uh, according to this grid to map out all of these points. And the contractors used that to build this thing and it actually worked. So this is like the second part of the kind of fake it till you make it where I, I took something that was completely incorrect and accurate and figured out a way to make it actually work in the space to, to actually uh, build it. So that's, that's that part. Um, the second part is this is a project I did with Jason Payne at UCLA, a studio called Difficult Fit, and this was 2003. 
This was, you know, after Yokohama Port Terminal uh, was built and opened. Um, it was a time of, of, of NURBS-based modeling and design. Uh, it was like surface was everything. And so this was, for me, uh, uh, shifting my interest um, both towards the kind of surface, but also the lamination of tectonic systems in relationship to, to the ground. So Riser and Riser Momoto was one of the firms I was looking at a lot. Uh, and so the project was for a, a triplex in the hillside of, of Los Angeles. But so that the residential part isn't really what's um, that interesting. Uh, so it was more about how uh, working with surface and understanding the ground as this abstract surface and redistributing its kind of materiality through geometric uh, construction. And so, you know, you get these kind of uh, complicated plans where all the systems are kind of entangled together. I'll just skip through these quick. And so this, this the sections uh, and the kind of x-ray elevations, I think for me, were, were the heart of the project and understanding the, the kind of abstract geological articulation of the ground as architecture and the architecture as a kind of delaminated ground. And so currently, uh, the last couple of years, I've been working on what I call ge uh, geological fictions, which has been the, the work that's come out of the 2GBX uh, studio in my section. And part of this interest is shifting from a kind of geometric imposition on, on land, on landscape, to image, uh, image and form uh, of the ground and land. And so this is a, there's a treatise by Eugene Villeneuve Le Duc, um, a geological treatise where he actually analyzed and studied uh, Mont Blanc. And so while he's more famous for uh, his restoration of Notre Dame and his work with introducing iron to, to architecture and building. This is quite a fascinating uh, uh, book in that how the architect as amateur geologist begins to understand terrain, in this case through drawing and imposing kind of geometric order. And so in this series that you're seeing here, he's trying to describe the impact of glaciers on the transformation of a part of Mont Blanc. But so rather than, you know, the, the uh, full material analysis, he's using the kind of geometric projection uh, onto that. And so what I've been doing is looking at making these machine terrains or hybrid terrains of merging together photorealistic imagery, satellite imagery of, uh, of the earth, basically, with more abstract um, imagery uh, to transform it and redefining what the geological section of this new terrain might be. And so the first set is, these are just more abstract studies of looking at producing the kind of tectonics uh, that would emerge out of uh, those types of surface uh, articulations. And then looking to produce this kind of um, uh, new kind of uh, geological section as an architectural object. So almost like looking at um, if you were to find sectional representations of geology and like mines and things like that that happen underground and turn that into an object that would sit on the ground. And so a lot, a lot of this work comes from my interest in both Bruno Latour's recent writings on um, eco ecological thinking and the problem with our view on nature and the divide of nature culture, as well as the writings of James Lovelock and his, his Gaia theory, which he kind of posed out there back in the 70s or 80s, which is his way of, he's, James Lovelock is introducing Gaia, which is Greek for Mother Earth, um, but reintroducing this idea of the of how do we understand the biosphere um, with all of the things that dwell and live on it um, to rethink e e ecology, basically. And so this is the most recent thing. This is also from the recent TGX studio. This is kind of my take on uh, a LACMA proposal where a pair of 
different kind of terrains um, were distributed along with uh, typological museum spaces um, and, and sandwiched together. That's it, I'm done. Thank you. I mean, it's like a, a time travel also, the same, it was <laughs> Christy last year. <laughs> Similar projects you're going to see of the whole generation of the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, you'll find similar diagrams and wireframes and renders. Um, so I, I would like to open uh, for questions. Uh, I would like that, you know, any questions from the students. Again, you know, you can direct the questions to each, um, uh, to Sean or to Ramiro. Um, or you can just talk about uh, the issue of, you know, I think it's interesting to see in both is the application of whatever they're thinking to however they're building a brief or an exhibition, um, you know, the kind of correlation of um, a project with, uh, you know, with, a, with, a, um, with the school environment, you know, what happens, uh, uh, with you know everything that we kind of we teach so so let me see let me see the chat uh, Christy you want to say that remember that Christy remembers that project when she went to UCLA also the overlaps um, yeah. yeah I just started at UCLA I think in the fall um, and I was in Emmer too so I was like just you know turning on the computer and I remember seeing Ramiro do that because I think you did that in your second year of the MR2. Well, I was, at, I, was at, I was MR2 as well. So. Oh, yeah. then maybe I just saw it as like a reference when we came in, or maybe Jason showed it to us mm -hmm. as like a way to be like, oh, you guys can't do anything now, but hopefully in like six months you can. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely remember that project. Students should know what a bad render was in that time. You know, we should show a span. Hey, of, uh, <laughs> hey but that was a really no, good, a good render one. for that time. Right. That was like, a good Ramiro. I think you should show <laughs> how difficult it was. This is what I was saying. It was. I was a horrible render. <laughs> no, no, I've seen, I've seen. We'll see more lectures. <laughs> yeah, well, I actually have a question for John. I think the... Um, the, you know, there's a there seems to be a lot of talk now about um, you know how we rewrite history, and then maybe how do we approach an architectural project um, from a different understanding of history. I mean, I, I think the discussion of how history is written has has been around for a while, and we could talk about like the difference between um, you know the meta narratives of history versus genealogies and Nietzsche's introduction of more local histories and how that impacted Deleuzian philosophy and the fact that everything has a history potentially, right? Um, but coming at it from, uh, I guess, a more social cultural angle, I think is quite fascinating. And it seems that, um, I, guess, I guess maybe it's still an open question, but how do, how do how do we produce an art? How do we create an architectural project? And this is obviously just a general question. From from while at the same time re, rewriting or redefining how history is written and understood and received. Yeah, that's a very. I mean, that's a very important and kind of profound thought to kind of work with. And I think. Um, I mean, I'm not in a position to kind of um, outline what a new architecture should be. And I think maybe that project of rewriting within architecture is in kind of very early stages mm -hmm. in kind of broad institutional terms. So in a sense, I would say maybe to uh, kind of hold off from even kind of trying that as if one would sort of read alternative histories, reread the archive, become aware of new things, and then as it were, try and kind of illustrate them. Mm -hmm, right. I think it's more a, a much more kind of indirect mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. than that. And I think just kind of immersing oneself in uh, 
like non-canonical and previously kind of minimized or peripheralized aesthetic traditions is the kind of like spiritual, physical, aesthetic exercise that one rehearses in order to train and develop an emergent aesthetic sensibility. Mm-hmm. And I think um, in terms of practice, I think maybe, uh, you know, the kind of the art, art world is maybe a little bit of head of architecture in, in this sense. I mean, that was really what blew me away when I arrived at Yale for the first time. It was the first time I'd arrived in the Americas. And like I said, I had brought, I like, got there on the basis of doing uh, a kind of a kind of European art history project. Mm-hmm. But it was so obvious to me immediately that you had artists, uh, you know, like um, uh, David Hammonds, Michalina, Thomas, um, and they who were kind of at Yale, Barclay Hendricks. And I was like, this, this stuff is the most progressive and mm-hmm. radical and challenging. And so I just wanted to kind of switch to that. And I had no like pre-existing background in that materials. But I guess after a couple of years, two, three years maybe of just immersing in it, you find places where you can start operating. Mm-hmm. So I think part of me wants to say that there's no there's no quick leap you can you can make. You just kind of got to trust yourself and like go into the unknown. And um, I mean, I guess a bit like the operation of the mountain on Violette Le Duc. You know, mm-hmm. he scaled it, he drew it, he watched it, he must have just contemplated it. And then at a certain point, Mont Blanc made its way into him. Right. And I, I think that, um, like what you were saying, is that you just threw yourself into something, you know, like fake it. And- and, but it'll it'll come, and I thought that was really profound in what you were saying about Violet Le Duc and uh, and Mont Blanc. I think it would be a similar kind of logic. But, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's funny. So, so uh, Vincent commented about reminding you of Andrew Zaga. But just a note. It's funny. Um, after my first year at Fire, which was all Carl Chu, both semesters which is a lot of Carl Chu for anyone who knows, who knows about Carl. Um, but so the second year, Andrew Zago taught that first year class. So when I was in second year, he taught the first year. I remember he did these amazing uh, maps. The students had to map the city of LA. They produced these mylar, these large scale mylar drawing maps. I remember some friends of mine were in that class and they were mapping smog. I remember they were just like so frustrated, like with like stippling with uh, rotring uh, ink pens, just mapping the smog, you know, figuring out a way to map the smog of LA. Now, so you have these kind of uh, first year at, at Sark at that point was marked by these incredibly experimental, non building kind of drawing formal production techniques that you had no. As a young student, you had no idea like where they were going, what they were about. Um, thank you both for uh, the amazing lectures. It was really interesting to see both of your work. Um, between last lecture, last week and this week, I've been thinking about um, kind of the project of Syrac, um and how fundamentally we're all gonna produce Syrac theses, like inextricable from the institution. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, it's, it's hard to like look at our exact moment and say like, oh, this is the trend that's happening at Syrac right now. This is how it's manifesting in the projects. Uh, but it's funny to see like uh, Ramiro and Christy talk, you guys talking about UCLA and seeing those projects then, and, like somehow our current moment is a bit a legacy of that moment. Um, so yeah. I don't know if you all have ideas about both the current moment of thesis and like what the kind of, I don't know, energy is about that. And also thinking back to your time in thesis and how you felt the institution that you were at was influencing your work. Hmm. Hmm. 
Yeah, I, I don't know that you, I mean, as you guys are now, I, I think when you're in grad school, you're, you're so focused and you're working so hard. I mean, in a, in a way, this, these are nice moments for you to have the time to kind of reflect. Um, I think if I, if I think back, particularly because I did an MRC two, so it was like a four quarters. It was so fast and I had so much to learn, both uh, culturally and technically, um, that I don't know that at the time I took any, I was able to take any evaluation in terms right. of like, oh, this is, what's, this is what's happening. Certainly later on, um, I, I, can do it much, I can do it much better, but I, I, I don't know at the time if I could, and I don't know if um, one should feel the pressure to do it while they're in it. I would say I was very aware though of the types of people that were around me at that time. Right. Um, it was hard to miss Sylvia Lavin, who was our director. Um, she, she was a fierce leader uh, and you know, also caused, uh, there, was always, there was always petitions with the students because she would do something and then the students would you know, um, wanna have a discussion about it. And you know, she even made the, you know, the LA Times um, at one at one point because the students uh, were in kind of a little bit of a tension and so I mean we could go into details about that but I'm not sure that it totally matters I think what matters is I was pretty aware at that moment that I was at a place where people both my peers um, but the teachers too um, were at a place where they were actively in tension and that mm -hmm. things were changing in the field you know, I would go, I would be in studio with Greg Lynn, who, you know, at the time, you know, office named Form and, um, you know, real champion of, of the digital and how it was going to change, not just how we produce it, but how we uh, design it and think about it and all of that. You know, and then I would go to history and theory class with Bob Zomol. And Bob was, you know, taking things, he was, he was putting it in a different view. And, um, you know, if you listen to Greg, that was like, that was the only way. There was only one way, and it was that way. You go to, you know, you went to history theory class, and Bob was like, yeah, and there's Greg, and he's, he's here. And then there's like these people. And, you know, you as a student would be like, ah, okay. You know, so I mean, I would say as a student, I was aware that there was like productive um, tension, and like that's exactly, um, you know, where I wanted to be at that time. And it's funny that you mentioned, because, uh... I mean, Bob was really the one that was putting everything in perspective. And yeah. I don't know, Christy, Christy, was it the same for you? And I remember when, when I entered UCLA, you had to pick whether you were going to focus on theory or technology. Huh. I don't know if you had to do that. I because think they might it, have gotten rid of that. They always okay. talked about it as like a three-legged stool. It was like technology, design, and culture something yeah so for my class like you had to you have to pick a theory track or a technology track hmm. and what was weird was that I was in, more interested in theory at that time so I picked theory which meant that I got put with Bob Somal so my research studio was you know three quarters with Bob I see. but my interests were more <laughs> Greg and so Bob Bob would get really <laughs> frustrated because I wanted design from him yeah He's yeah like, no I don't do that <laughs> yeah yeah so I don't there know was that. Also, I mean, oh, go ahead. No, so it's like what, what you were saying about the, you know, the MR2 at UCLA being one year. And it was also, it's also very fast, but also like I was very unaware of the political turmoil that was going on there between certain group of faculty and Sylvia mm -hmm. and certain students that were aligning themselves with this group of faculty. And there was a lot of tension and animosity there that I think being so focused in the program and I guess these, the, the faculty that you select to, to kind of be a part of, um, that for me, it was like, I, I was kind of unaware of it uh, mm -hmm. until the very end about what was really going on there. Um, but I think, I mean, to get maybe back to your, your question, Christina, um, I, I, yeah, I don't, I, maybe similar to what Chrissy was alluding to, I find it hard to, in the moment, especially when I was in grad school, grad school to zoom out and see the bigger picture. Um, I think that you find intuitively, you find things that you have affinities for. You basically, you're, you're finding out what your values are, you know, your values as a person and as an architect and as a professional. 
you know, and so I think that, you know, for me anyway, it was about pointing myself in the vector of those values and working with those that fit that, you know. And then what, you know, that's why I think like me looking back on it now is like, oh my God, there is a kind of connection here. You know, there is a, a, a correlation, like you can see the interests, uh, um, even though they're, changing, modifying, there's a thread that continues that I don't know if you can get rid of if you tried. Yeah, I thought it was so fascinating how that drawing that you showed from UCLA was so similar to the drawings by Ledoux. Uh, in some way, the kind of layering of that Ledoux drawing and then the kind of layering of the one that you had done, it, it's really fascinating how similar that is. And I had no idea about that that book at that point so i just i just came across that book a year ago by the yeah. sean i think that um you know in a way to christina's point you represent them no i mean i think that we cover <laughs> but we you see all the lecture and also we are a group you know i think to 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 christy's and ramiro's point we are a group we all went to school the same time different schools um, same shift. Um, they were, you see, I was at Columbia the year before Ramiro was there. Um, and then you, you, should, you go through the list and you see that we're all from that moment. And so I think that, Sean, maybe you can talk about this moment. Maybe to Christina, you can address their question because yeah. you guys are going to be like we are with Ramiro, with Christy, we, we travel the same route, you know? Um, you know, and then we, we know exactly the things that happen. So I think maybe Sean, you can talk to that, to what's today. And I, and I, and I, I find fascinating of your, which I think that you guys have done. And I think your thesis has to do with a little bit breaking the chains from the past, the, the, the you know, European centric past of a Euro education like us, even though that it was revolutionary, what we were learning at that moment. Um, but I think that it's like breaking from the past of, or, you know, of, of our generation, you know, in a way. Your time in school is saying, okay, we need to burn down and begin, a, you know, a new, a, you know, um, a new history. And that history is not the, the old history. It's the history from the late 90s and the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the history I think it's like breaking down. So, I mean, if you could talk to that. Yeah, but I, but you, I also think, yeah. uh, I also think it's really difficult when you're in a moment to yeah. see outside of it. Yeah. And I almost think um, maybe you don't even w want to do that. To a certain extent, you've got to sort of trust in your own like moral aesthetic compass. Mm -hmm. And I think the moment you start to think and question too much, what am I doing? Is it the right thing? How does it relate to the current situation? What is the current situation? Kind of becomes paralyzing. Right. And so in a way, I think you've just got to jump and like trust in like, I don't know, yourself as it has been formed by your current actions up till now and trust that it's gonna, you're gonna develop some kind of parachutes and you, that you'll, you'll be all right. And I think it's really, it's really amazing to see, um, uh, you know, the three other presentations that I've seen that kind of hindsight like i feel you you've worked you like you've done enough projects in a row to be able to constitute like remember what you were saying like a genealogy or something i feel like my projects are a bit there's like maybe not enough of them or they're too condensed mm. to really see that kind of trajectory and overly evaluate it and i think when you're in the middle of a project i feel uh I'm not saying be like recklessly inconsiderate about the contextualization of your work or its potential impact and relationality to other things that are going on. But I guess also one just has to kind of accept that you're not going to be able to 
free next. And um, so just kind of like, I feel like believe, believe in your intuitions. Maybe it's like a, a dash line frame versus a solid line frame. Like, so I, I, I agree with what you were saying earlier that if you, if when you're in the moment, if you try to frame it in, in, the, in the most objective sense, you paralyze yourself and you, you intervene in the bottom up emergent organicism mm -hmm. of the production of work. And if you intervene in that too early, you can kind of uh, um, stifle it or, or, you know, direct it in, in an unnatural, you know, unnatural way for lack of a better term. But that's why there's something, you know, you need a certain amount of time and distance uh, and production to go back in to organize it for what it is, as opposed to imposing the order too early. Yeah. And I would say maybe also that I feel like, in a certain sense, methodology is way more important than uh, context. In, in the sense that when you make a decision about the methodology that you're working with, I feel that determines all of the key aspects of the work and how ultimately it will be seen in relation to a context. And this, I mean, I just, this was a thought that came to me really clearly when I was writing that piece with Mira. And I just kind of had this feeling that like, actually, I, I don't want to kind of write stuff. Like, I don't want to single author stuff. Maybe kind of like, never. And I just like, that, that decision, that like mutual decision that and this will be a conversation. It's a two person conversation immediately that sort of became like the most for me at least the most important determinator of everything that was said like ideologically and architecturally and whatever rather than like me conceptualizing my own work or something it's just a really simple decision i like i will do this together mm -hmm. and i think maybe just in one's working practices those are the things that ultimately determine it's like your methodologies ultimately that determine all of that other stuff for you mm -hmm. is it it's i mean it sounds like you're talking about both an ethos of practice but also an aesthetic like the let's say the legibility of authorship of the single author like the of the stark attack mm. There's an aesthetic mm. aspect to be being able to identify the signature of the you know single virtuosic uh, architect author right um, versus producing that image through collaboration right so I think there's this interesting relationship between yeah. the ethic of production and practice and its mm. relationship to aesthetic yeah. output and it's not it's not such a clear cut kind of relationship. That's a nice way of putting it, yeah. And I think, John, what I really appreciate is the parallel that you draw between working collectively as a design practice, as a kind of act of producing something together and then writing collectively. Mm. Because I, I know I've often tried to write with one of my partners, Ulrika Carlson, and it's, it's one of the more challenging uh, acts to, because we're used to you know, being trained to write and produce theory from a particular voice and i yeah. love the idea that when multiple voices come into play we begin to distribute that and we begin to you know to borrow the title of, of zadie smith's book changing my mind i think she also yeah. writes very beautifully about that about how oh. one can change one's mind through the act of of producing something in that case a text so I, I, yeah. I'm looking forward to reading that. Is, I haven't nice gotten thought. my log issue. Yeah. Is, I know, I haven't either. I need to check oh. to make sure my subscription hasn't ran out. <laughs> well, make sure uh, the USPS is still in service in your area. It's not in mine. Oh, interesting. That's so bad. I haven't received um, mail in a week. But maybe did you, did, did you, I just was curious if you, how that, how like how long that process took or how you said it began as a series of conversations and then you began yeah. to write it down or both of you began to write it down. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, well, it really, I mean, the project really originates with Mira because she was asked by um, Bryony Roberts, who edited that the last edition, uh, if she would write a piece uh, based on her Architectural League Prize work. Um, and, you know, that was sometime in the fall. And like, I didn't know Mira before um, I arrived at SIOC. And I guess, you know, we're just, so the conversation just originated, like, I don't know, like Marcel and I, we have a conversation too, and what one has conversations with colleagues, yeah. whatever. And, and then uh, we did a base camp together with David Eskenazi and, and there's a kind of resonance, whatever. So, and, and then she sort of uh, invited me to just kind of participate and we didn't really have any set idea of what form it would take. But it um, just, it, yeah, it involved a lot of conversation and then writing stuff down and editing and like, it's really, it's hard work actually. Mm. Uh, writing with somebody else and negotiating boundaries and proportions and quantities and so on but you know in like in terms of careers i feel like maybe this is somewhere where i feel like close to all you guys doing thesis now is that in thesis and immediately afterwards there's like massive pressure that you have to be a really special standout singular student you're going to have your own style, your own identifiable projects. Like you're going to have loads of followers. You're going to have a cool website and all of this stuff. And then when you go into like jobs, especially if you go into the academic world, like you have to kind of cultivate your own personality. And I've always found that quite uncomfortable. And one of the writers who's been really influential on me, especially lately, is uh, Fred Moten. You know, like, he kind of writes about everything, uh, like jazz, contemporary art, space, landscape, everything. And he recently published a trilogy of like a compilation of theoretical texts, which is called Consent Not to Be a Single Being. And it like frame, and he writes a lot of stuff collaboratively, but it seems to me it's both that statement, consent not to be a single being. It's both like a methodological imperative and an ontological system. And mm. I really f feel that this is a kind of an um, emergent thing in terms of career, is that the market wants you to individualize, hyper-specialize, isolate, alienate, and produce and consume. So to consent not to be a single being is to, to kind of share agency and to collaborate and like, yeah. like explode iconicity. I think that is like a new way of working and being, which just to me feels more right. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like uh, there have been experiences where, like I, I, I would maybe argue or put out there then format becomes important in a certain sense because like the idea like the google doc like the shared google doc mm. that multiple people can access like mm. i've i don't know marcelin weren't you part of this where like with tom there was like with tom this one there was like three or four people involved in writing like we had to quickly write something for i forgot this was like several years ago but we were each on this document editing adding suggesting and all of a sudden like it just emerged into this coherent document but there wasn't a single author there was four when you couldn't clearly pin it wasn't like four paragraphs it was all intermixed and you couldn't delineate you know the, the which author wrote what mm -hmm. it's quite quite interesting and so I, I also find this useful in when I ask students to write project statements using the Google Doc platform, that you can give them feedback to suggestions, they can rewrite it. So over time it evolves. And so even though it's for their project, it's still a collaboration in that sense. Yeah, I think one thing that's quite interesting about, uh, I would say SciArc as like a, a teaching institution, um, is that 
at least in my experience at Ohio State, if you're at a, a larger academic institution and you're um, on tenure or on a tenure track, um, the things that we're discussing, I, um, I completely agree, John. I, in the last three, three years since I've been at SciArc, almost all my writing has been collective with Kelly. But for the couple years where we overlapped and I was working with her, but I, we were both on tenure tracks, it was very explicit from an institutional level that you that even though we were working together, we needed to, to make sure that we had enough both design work and written work that that they could know that it was one voice. And so I think what you're bringing up in, and I think it's coming up in a lot of conversations right now is there's like our individual initiative and ambition to want to do different things differently, but then we're definitely um, going to need to work on those larger institutions, um, you know, because yeah, otherwise, sure. like things that you wrote together and even like design things, you had to, like a tenuring committee would say, well, how do I know that you did this, right? We, we mm -hmm. can't give, we can't mm -hmm. offer uh, tenure and, and, you know, all of that nonsense in a way. Um, so it's so, something, it's something larger to, for all of us to think about as, as we yeah. go forward. It's, it's so true. Um, when John was tenure track at USC, it was a big problem. Like uh, basically he had to do these other projects separate from Griffin Enright. Like yeah. Griffin Enright work like didn't count essentially yeah. because of the Griffin part of it. And so it was really hard. And a lot of these institutions uh, for when you go for tenure, it like requires this individuated condition. And yeah, it does seem extremely backwards thinking um, and there's a lot of fields it seems to be especially so in architecture whereas there's other fields uh, like the one my sister is in for instance she collaborates with writing all the time and she's able to count it for her tenure so i think actually part of that problem is especially arch uh, more rampant in architecture uh, oddly enough anyway yeah, I mean, it's interesting. A, a note from Faris. Faris, I didn't know you went to your OSU, but I mean, maybe a question is like, you know, in Sire, we do a lot of, you guys do a lot of partner projects. Um, and, and you, in a way, you find um, not only it helps in, in, I think, just listening to this conversation, but I think it's a, it's a sense of community, of share ideas. And also what Sean was saying, you might, you're in there, you don't, you know, you don't want to develop, um, you know, kind of a, in the search of a single voice, but you know, it's just really understanding the problems and working together. So I don't have my glasses, but um, I just wanted to point out to that comment of group projects in studios. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's interesting that how the structures of practice that are in place kind of promote these things. So. I mean, it, it, one can argue that it's a capitalist problem, uh, a political problem, a structural problem in how practices, you know, run. So it was making me think that, you know, the typical large architecture office is broken up like the, like a Ford production line, right? Like you've got the designers and then you've got those people. Everyone is um, uh, put into their area of kind of specialty in terms of what they work on. So while there's many people working on one project, it's very segregated in terms of who works on what. So that kind of segmented type of production is, an, is part of this old industrial revolution model of practice, like treating people like machines in that sense versus switching to different platforms that might foster a different kind of movement where you can, you can maybe work more like a boutique practice where you might work on multiple aspects of a project but in a larger uh, kind of structure that would make it more uh, kind of uh, not just fluid and egalitarian but it would produce that kind of the ethos and the aesthetic would come together in a certain way yeah, i wanted to see if uh, any of the students have any questions any final questions Fatima is saying, I think group project at school should be optional, like real life. 
um, I think, I mean, that was such a note through uh, this conversation. I don't know if anybody has an answer to Fatima, but of, of like the, the benefits of really working in partnership. Um, we have many, you know, not only real life, meaning we always on real life Fatima, no? That's right. <laughs> like school is also real life. Um, it might be a, a kind of training, but I would say in, in professional and the professional realm, um, Actually, professional realm should work more like the school environment where there's so much, you know, community, share uh, ideas and so on. Hey, Ramir, I had a question. I have, uh, oh. oh, Andrew, that's question. Andrew. Okay. Well, I was, I was just thinking, could you kind of nail down on maybe your impetus to go out on your own with a partner into the practice at that age? Like, and maybe what kind of, because it was kind of before you maybe had that kind of alignment or order of your idea of your own thesis, what your thesis was going to be. But nonetheless, you still went out there. What was the impetus? And then what were maybe some kind of models that were pre-existing out there, like the Tom Main at 26, 2468 kind of stuff? Like, what were some kind of, yeah, pre-existing idea of an office really starting with? kind of that hard work you count when count then work or, or more like you put it the um, fake it till you make it yeah I have, uh, to be honest I well that latter part I'm not sure I could answer I mean although I mean I know Morphosis started off kind of building their own projects uh, to a certain level um, in LA but I mean for me the emphasis was really opportunity and hunger to build you know yeah yeah and 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 not wanting to work for anyone <laughs> Yeah, so those, those three things seem to align and the opportunity was there and I just grabbed it and, and wrote it. Sure, sure. Well, or just to keep you going for even six years, I guess once you start getting your first commissions, it's kind of, but to just kind of in a, some sense be a little bit rudderless, you know, in terms of a precedent, but well, great. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to point out to Max a uh, question. Max, do you want to read it yourself? Because I read it. Um, um, are you there, Max? Yes. Yeah, I'm here. I'm Go here. ahead. Yes. It's long, so I decided to put it down. Yes, I see. I see. Maybe it's just can make or make a note. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm just asking, like, you know, where do you as faculty members and as coordinators of, like, different parts of this institution, like, where do you see, I can read it here, but where do you all see Cyrix institutional confidence and the growth of the student uh, and the faculty member as well as a multi-instrumentalist. So like, as we have multiple interests, multiple skill sets that we like to, you know, sometimes specialize in, sometimes combine. Um, uh, we're using social media to teach now, um, uh, which allows these like, you know, the rec recognition of the, per the person, the individual as having like these multiple sides and multiple interests um, by having a platform that is, you know, creates an equivalency between any kind of post. It's all square, right, at the end of the day. Um, and, but then it also allows collaboration to be recognized in like, in a way that um, maybe wasn't so much before in the sort of like identity branding, blah, 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 that we sort of conversation that developed from like the 90s into the 2000s. Um, so yeah, does that, I don't know, I guess I'm just wondering like, as the, as the individual student is like taught that it's good to be a, uh, um, you know, be able to like have multiple interests and have multiple skill sets to have like a diversity of, um, of references that they want to bring in or, or, um, you know, their own idiosyncrasies or something like that, maybe showing a little bit, um, where do you all see that, uh, going in like in, inside the walls of the school or, you know, I don't know, <laughs> I mean, but what, what you're, um, Raising makes me think of, um, let's say, the inversion of, you know, like, I think it's for a long time, architects have been um, known for having a breadth of knowledge about a lot of, like knowing a little bit about a lot of things, right? And so I think like in, in my undergrad education, I would put it as, you know, I had limited skill set, like very specific skill set because of the tools that were available but I was being taught a breadth of things, right, in terms of knowledge. And perhaps 
today there's an inversion where you guys are developing a breadth of skill sets, you know, um, not to say that, that that means that the breadth of knowledge is going away, but maybe it means that you want to match both. Like you don't want to exchange one for the other, but I still, I still see the value in architects having a breadth of knowledge mm -hmm. uh, across a lot of different, um, different, uh, different disciplines and, and, and cultural uh, genres and things like that. I still think even more so now than ever, it's important to have that. But perhaps now there's the ability to match that with the breadth of skill set to be fluid in working across platforms and modes of thinking. Without without having to choose one. <clears throat> right. No, so you're not <clears throat> like the photographer designer. I think Max, you know, to that point, you can also work through these multiple platforms and yet um, you know, weaves through them. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, I, I heard Hernan put it one in one way, kind of new coherencies. Mm. As you move on. Oh. Um, was, yes. Was it Margaret? Was two four six eight? Was that that was her first house? I I wouldn't I'm I, not a hundred percent sure, but I just know that uh, you know it was 1979. Yeah, I mean I was <coughs> I was probably totally off on that. It was just more that kind of Tom Maine and those guys had there was kind of almost a cultural advocacy of building on your own that seemed to be unique to SciArc to some degree. You know, I mean just you going back to Carl Chu, a first year project to help kind of bring along a an actual professional project is just a w wonderful and really speaks to more the sensibility than any particular mode of working, you know, that probably Carl brought. Yeah, and coming from someone, you know, Carl has no interest in building, you know, so, <laughs> that's why he's like an outlier where he can care less about built reality. I, one thing, one question, Max, I have is that when you're talking about we're using social media to teach now, uh, citing, I don't think that we use them to teach. Uh, I, you know, I think that we're just using them to propagate um, knowledge, to talk to more constituencies, to to talk to you. I don't, I don't think that. Um, I mean, we could all do like a. YouTube recording and then email it to everybody. But you know, I, I don't know. At least in thesis, we're trying to say, well, let's use the platforms that are there. But we don't use them to teach. I, I would say we're still in the one-to-one. -one. You know, I, I would say something. Uh, I wanted to say that it's quite present in this thing that I think that or Sean was talking or Ramiro uh, and last week Christian Math Christian Matthew Al. One thing that you have at SciArc doesn't relate to platform to the kind of um, pervasiveness of the platforms, but the human connection. Look how Matthew was talking about the first studio that he did with Andrew Sago. He's now a colleague of Andrew Sago. Or Christy talking about, um, you know, the work that she was doing in the studio that the Ramiro took, and then how both they can today email Bob Sommel or Greg Lynn. And, you know, so it is about that human connection. Um, that you have with the faculty, which is this what we're doing, even though it's inhuman because we are in screen right now. But there's something about the the ever staying. Marceline was a teacher of Mar or Christie, so I'm just going through the screen. Um, I was teaching at Princeton when Sean Cooper was there, <laughs> like two years ago, not too long ago. You know, they're like there's like there's like there's something about the human connection that. It seems that no matter what platforms you use, look how it still is 20 years and, you know, and we have faculty from different, um, um, you know, uh, from different um, decades. Uh, and so, but the human connection always stays. No matter that Ramiro ended up doing the, what is the, it's not, what is it called? This, 
the snake, how you call the French curve? Oh, the flexible snake. I don't know if that's a technical term for it. I, I mean, we use, I don't know. The, no matter that it's a flexible snake and two years later, it was a spline. It was a spline, uh, no right. matter the, 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 yeah, no matter the platforms, the human connection, it is, is there. So I think that's something that we, we value at SciArc. And I think to Fatima's point, whether you work in groups or you don't, those friends that you have, Christy talked how her partner in her studio is her partner in her office today. So I, I don't think that you have to see like whether you work in groups or not, is that where you start to set up certain relationships, exchange of ideas, that will stay with you for a long time. You know, I invite my friends from school to my reviews, and we still, you know, it's still the, the, those, the human connection, I think beyond the theories, beyond all of that, I think the human side of this discipline, I think that's something is very valuable. And it's something very valuable at SIAR. Um, so I think, I mean, I was, sorry that you guys, I was, I was sending a sign-up list. I, I'm just shocked that I have half of the student body in this which I think that are great, not only that you might see it on YouTube, but I mean, half of the 80 something students are, are right here. So I think it'd be important that, I don't know, that all the students see the value of this. Whether it's, if I make it require, I, I wouldn't like it. I mean, it's just simply, yeah. it'd be nice that it's a, you know, it's a kind of bigger conversation. Yeah, I think also, I know I've talked to John Cooper about this a little bit, but also like, in the shift, especially now, especially with all this going on, I think that architecture really needs to shift to a more transparent um, way of working. Because, um, I mean, people, I mean, I just like working in a firm and stuff like that. I've always noticed how architects always try to keep, or designers in general, just try to keep their designs so sheltered throughout the process and and aim to to you know suppress or um, keep opinions about their projects from being released. And I think that we as designers can really benefit from allowing this transparency to happen, especially now with, um, with the whole Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, it, it's important to get those kinds of people's opinions about what's going on and what you're designing, because you really, we need to design to benefit everybody. And I think that the way that architects work right now is not doing that. So that's just like one thing that I've have been thinking about, especially in my own work, how I can start to introduce those levels of transparency. So with that, thank you, Jonathan. And everybody, I think that yeah, being I would I would see the, the what you're talking about transparency being uh, more true to yourself and and okay. and you know and so I'm being um, you know honest about you know misgivings of how you can work on a project, what things you can do. Um, anyway, so I think that our career days are are great for that because these are not I think Christy was is not the end of the career; it's the arc. <laughs> so. So, think continue mostly. Not the high point. I hope, I hope, I hope point. I'm in the middle arc too. <laughs> yeah, but like the middle, it, but the middle arc, not the middle arch. You just have to right. make sure that it's not just like that you're not like on the on the right. on the downslide. We all have to keep growing and learning, and and that's what we do with all of you mm -hmm. students. Um, we we obviously um, on a day to day basis can't teach uh, what we learned in a package uh, 15, 20 years ago, even mm -hmm. though it for sure influences um some of some of the ways that that we work so thank you to everybody i think that we went a little bit uh, over time but you know this is uh, the nature of a uh, large conversation so thank you everybody and uh, for the students again thank you to uh, ramiro yeah. and sean thank you john uh, and ramiro yeah thanks thanks, thanks everyone for, for presenting for your time. project um and Friday, uh, Christina had the question of, I'll, I think I'll, I'm just going to make two Zooms, and so that will be easier. We will begin to the Zoom, so I see you at, at 2 o'clock. Remember that uh, live chat now is at 2 o'clock. Uh, we'll, we'll start with one Zoom, and then we will split into two Zooms, um, you know, so that way we can have smaller groups and activate more of the conversation. 
Great. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ga and please, you, uh, uh, the chat students, I'll ask the advisors, you ask your advisors, please, please join me on Friday. Uh, let's do a double uh, request to advisors. Okay, thank you, guys. Thank you, bye.